Hi, Fran. Hiya. Hi, how are you? Are you okay? Yeah, you. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'll um, I'll just start letting everybody in. We'll just give it a couple of okay. minutes to let everybody settle down, and then we'll just get straight into it. Okay, that's cool. Okay, any questions before we start? No, I'm good. Well, good, very good. All right, we'll get them, we'll get them in. Good evening, everybody. They're all hiding the faces tonight. <laughs> Good evening, Grace. You've been waiting for this for a few weeks, haven't you? Hi, uh, Grace. <laughs> okay, good. we'll get into it. It's a little bit slow tonight with people checking in, but we'll just enter them in as we get on. So tonight we're joined by Frank Kitchen. I'm sure, especially the girls will know who she is, some of the boys will get to know who she is in the next hour or so. Which is the Sheffield United ladies goalkeeper. So, hi, Fran. Thanks for joining us. Hi, everyone. Good. So, what I like to kick all these zooms off by just asking uh, how the goalkeepers first got into into goalkeeping and how you started as a goalkeeper from from the very start, really. Okay, so I originally didn't want to be a goalkeeper, which I think is kind of the normal. Yeah. Um, I used to play on the garden with my brother. He was a midfielder, so he used to stick me in the net and try and score past me. Um, and then eventually I got good at it. So my dad set up a team, which was Wickersley Youth at the time, which was the first girls team. Um, and he didn't have a goalkeeper and I ended up being in the net. So um, I switched. I used to switch at half time and he'd make someone else go in the goal so I could play. So I was also a striker. Um, so that was kind of how I got into it. And then from there, I was at Wicked as a Youth, I think about four or five years. So I started when I was seven. And I think I was there until I was about uh, 11. And then I signed for Chef United Academy, uh, mm. where I was there until I was 15. And I actually trialed there as a goalkeeper and a striker. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> they preferred me as a goalkeeper. Um, and then I left there when I was 15 and I went and signed for Man United Academy for the last year at RTC, which is academy level. Um, as Sheffield you know, United didn't have a women's team at that time. And funnily enough, neither did uh, Man United, but my dad believed it would give me better links getting into women's football if I moved teams. And God, I never thought I'd be at Man United. Yeah. <laughs> so I went and then from there, I got scouted for Chelsea when I was 16. Um, and I went and signed for them on my 17th birthday. Um, and I was there for three years, um, playing for both the development team and played a couple of games for the first team as well. Um, and I was like the regular choice at so, that time. So you had, to leave, you had to leave home at 17 then? Yeah, well, I actually left there when I was 16 and my child was on my 17th birthday. Right. And they signed this time on the day I trialed, um, which was just a, an amazing feeling to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I moved home when I moved out when I was seventeen, and it seems a bit weird to be back really because I moved home when I was seventeen, and now I'm twenty three, six years later, and I'm yeah. back living at home again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you take that then? So, so a big jump, felt chasing your dream. Moving away from home, what, what was the setup like down down at Chelsea for you? Um, it was a bit crazy to be honest because I was in the first year of my A levels, and obviously a lot of the girls will know that the route into football is not the same as what it is for boys. So obviously you get a scholarship and you get your studies alongside, and you might get your day release or whatever from your academy to go and um, from schools to go and train. Um, but obviously that's not the case of football. So for the first year, I was actually 
Um, I joined a school down there, which was weird because I've been at the same school since I was a baby. Um, I knew all my friends and then moving there, didn't know anybody. Um, So I was finishing my A-levels off while I was down there. And I'd go to school in the morning at like half eight. I'd leave, to be fair, the school were amazing, but I'd leave school at about half 11, go and train 12 until two. And then I'd go back to school two till three. Wow. So it was crazy. Yeah. Um, I was training with the first team through the day. So they worked it in quite a good way. Um, obviously, Chelsea and the school, so that I could fit both in. Um, and I think it, my attendance from that year was something like 20% at school. It was that low. And I actually yeah. ended up leaving with two A levels. <laughs> so is, is that something that Chelsea set, set up then with the school that that's what the girls tend to do? down there or was that something specific for you um I think they were always kind of adamant on that they didn't just want me to just that kind of sack it off let's say because I'd, I'd, I'd been quite clever and bright all the way through school so yeah. to just finish my A-levels and not graduate with anything um and I remember when I got my results and Emma Hayes was like I can't believe you've got two B's like I want earth have you done that on 20% attendance but um that was something that set up for me and I know that girls it was kind of like a guinea pig let's say right. and I know that girls have followed that since because they've got quite good links with that school now yeah and the good thing was the school was like five minutes from training ground right. so it worked quite well yeah I mean I think that the growth of uh, the women's games I mean over the last I mean, 10 years, but even more so over the last five years, it's it's really grown massively, hasn't it? And I think that investment with the youth as well, it's really growing and really encouraging for the young goalkeepers now that there actually is, there is a route now for them to get into into professional ladies football a little bit better than and like for the boys as well now. The girls is catching up with it, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I did, um, I did an interview recently with the Chef United staff and... I was saying about how mad it is now, like, if you're in the academy, to think that you can actually just get, there's a clear route straight into the women's team. And we've currently got one of the under-16 keepers training with us um, up at the first team. So we've got, like, four keepers now. Right. Um, and she's been really enjoying it. But it's so nice to see that that, that can be, like, a goal. And pe- you can actually hear people say, like, I want to be a professional footballer because... I never dreamed. I never dreamed of it. I guess until I got good at it and saw that it was a route. I never was like, I want to be a footballer. Yeah. Um, but I guess it kind of just fell into my hands, and then it just went from there. Yeah. I mean, I suppose when you very first started, I mean, the, the local teams in the area will have been Donny Bell's mainly, won't it? And yeah, Donny Bell's, and it was uh, Sheffield FC. And yeah. Obviously, Sheffield FC dropped out of the league, but they were the two teams that did really well, and. Um, I guess I probably would have ended up with one of those if I'd if I'd not signed for Chelsea with being local. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm glad to be back at Chef now, and it's it's nice to be back home. But I think I really needed that experience over the past few years um, to kind of grow. And I guess moving out at 17, <laughs> how else do you find your feet chucked yeah, in well, deep? It all makes you the goalkeeper you are today, don't they? All them experiences and and doing what you what you did. It makes you the person you are now. And I suppose if you'd have stopped local as you are, you wouldn't be the goalkeeper that you are today. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So when you were down at Chelsea, you had a little stint at Watford, didn't you, as well, on loan? Yeah, I did. So in my third season, um, they loaned me out to Watford um, and they was in the WSL2 at that point, which is now the championship. They they renamed it. Um, and I was there just for one season, which was really, really tough, to be honest. It was it was hard for me to go from kind of Chelsea of having such a winning mentality to Watford, who were, they'd got girls that want to just love to play football, but without being mean, weren't the best ability. So wow. as a goalkeeper, I'd come off every single game fuming because I'd save eight shots and would still lose 3-0. Yeah. So it kind of your, I think your performance kind of got a bit overshadowed by the result because even though I was playing probably the best best in form at that time, we were still losing, but there was nothing I could do about it. Yeah. 
Well, I think from a goalkeeping point of view, at the stage of your development, that 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 was good as well, though, because you was you was getting obviously plenty of work, even though it was frustrating that you wasn't getting the results in the games. It was good for your development side. By you, you wasn't just stood there watching. You were you were getting yeah, I mean, busiest busiest I've ever been ever. Yeah. Um, but I think the main thing I took away from that was mentally how to deal with it, and I know that. A lot of the young girls have asked me before when I've done stuff like this before, like, how do you react when you let a goal in? Like, if you think about that goal that you've just let in, then you're probably going to let another one in because you're still thinking about it. So I think the main thing was to just, I've always been told, just pretend it's nil-nil. It's it's nil-nil, even though a goal has gone in. Even if we we score, if my team score, I'm still acting as though it's nil-nil because who knows what's going to happen. And I think that's a good thing to take with you throughout your careers is to keep that in your mind because at the end of the day, there's 10 other players in front of you. And unless it's an error, which you probably know in your own mind that it's your mistake that you can learn from, then majority of the time it's probably not your fault. Yeah. And I, th- I think sometimes it's, it's a self-disappointment in your, within yourself, isn't it, that that does enough anyway. You, you don't need people telling you that you've made a mistake. And you don't, yeah, exactly, you're, exactly. You're in yourself, yeah. So, so that, that's a good tip, that. So from from Watford, did you then go back to Sheffield United for a little bit before you went to Liverpool? Yeah, so from Watford, um, Chelsea released me and said they wanted me to go and get game time. And to be honest, I feel like if my career does kind of shoot, I'd always want to go back there because I had such an amazing time at Chelsea. Yeah. Um, so I was actually meant to sign for Man United in their first year in the Championship at that point. Um, and last minute they got Siobhan Chamberlain and he was England's number one at the time. So that was a bit gutting because I ended up not signing there. Um, and I ended up at Sheffield United coming back home. Um, and then on deadline day, the transfer window, the league had not started yet. Liverpool coming for me, who were WSL one at the time. So I wasn't going to say no to it. And yeah. It was weird because I'd signed for Sheffield United for like three weeks, but I didn't expect Liverpool to come in for me and you can hardly turn down full-time football when Sheffield United is part-time yeah. at that time. So, um, yeah, so I went and signed for Liverpool then on deadline day for two seasons and then now it brings me back here. Uh, was, was Neil Redfern at Liverpool at the time? Yeah, so uh, Red has signed me then. Um, he was... He was the manager of Donny Bells in the season I was at Watford and I'd had two great games against Donny Bells, so I guess that's why he wanted to sign me. Um, and then obviously he left and we had another manager take over and obviously Redders is now at Sheffield United again and re-signed me again, so he must like me. <laughs> yeah. well, that, that's what we said. I mean, one of the things I always say to the students is you, you never know who's watching each game. You never know who's watching. So, And it might, it might like, like yourself there, where... It's probably a, a transferred order move a couple of seasons down the line or a couple of months down the line. It's probably it's probably a game that you played that you didn't even know that that person was watching you that actually helped get that. Yeah, exactly. Happen. Yeah, because I, I had something similar yeah. happened to me in, in my career as well, where it was it was a game that I was just playing and I didn't realise who was watching. And then when it came up that I was able to move, I did realise that, that that club was actually watching me in that game. Oh, wow. Yes, so, yeah, that's one of the tips that my dad would always say to me when I was probably Grace's age. That's the only one I can see on the screen at the minute. But when I was playing for the academy and stuff, we used to have England scouts coming all the time. And I guess that's every, every girl's dream is to play for their country, if you're English, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was something my dad would always say to me. And I guess, like you say, you, you don't know who's watching and that can take you very far. So, so you, you talk about your dad. Was your dad very influential then in, in your career? Yeah, my dad was very influential. My, um, Like I said, my brother played. My older sister played. We all played. So my dad was a semi-pro. Um, just played for a, a local team. Um, I can't remember what team it was right now, to be honest. I think it was Worksop. Um, but yeah, he's he's been supportive of all three of us all the way through and I guess I'm the one that's gone the furthest. Uh, my brother went on a football scholarship to America, so nice. he's always kind of given us the um, 
pushes we've needed and I guess the shoulder when we've needed to cry, yeah. um, which I guess is the most important thing. I mean, I mean, at one time, the, the, the route to America for the girls' football was, was probably one of the main, the main things, weren't it? Because obviously ladies' football in America is massive and I think we are catching up a little bit with them, but that used to be the main route what the young girls wanted to do was trying to get through to America. So why, did that ever come about or is it a decision you made not to go down that route? Yeah, I think um, it's definitely my my age group, as in 98 babies. Like at England, when I used to go to England camp, the amount of girls that was like, I'm going to America. When I leave school, like, it was just like a given thing. But I think the opportunity to sign for Chelsea and if I was to go to America to then come back and it might not be there, then... Do you know what I mean? I, it was an opportunity, yeah, as an answer to your question. Um, I went I went down to trial for Man City as well as Chelsea. They both came into it, but I ended up choosing Chelsea just because it just felt like the right the right move, even though that was the further one. Yeah. It felt like the right one to go to, but I didn't think that... I always believed if you could get a kind of move in the English league, why would you need to go to America? I know a lot of people do it for education reasons, but I guess it's kind of what's the best fit for you. Yeah, I, th I think it's, I mean, it's getting the right balance into it. At the time it was, it was it going down the education route to obviously continue your education and do your football as well as, whereas if you're wanting to solely focus on your football, then you'd probably, you'd probably stop closer to home and, and within England in that route. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, good. So, what one of the things that they focus a lot in the men's game, which I don't particularly agree with at the minute, and I don't, I don't think they focus so much on the on the in the ladies' game, is the heights of the goalkeepers. Obviously, in the men's game at the minute, they're expecting them to be six foot four, six foot six, and and in the women's game, it's it, it's not focused on so much. Do you think that'll change or or not? Um, I feel like subconsciously is a thing from my point of view for me being quite small um, and you see the goalkeepers in in kind of the WSL and the championship um, the WSL particularly being kind of tall and slimly athletic build um, with your Karen Bardsley's and uh, Siobhan Chamberlain's but I feel like now the younger generation coming through it's not as kind of um, shown as much I don't feel like I feel like if your ability shines then obviously look at college self he's not the biggest goalkeeper at all but look how far she's gone in her career yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's crazy that that's the thing and I've spoke to so many um, so many boys in that position that have um been in that situation where they could have gone pro and the reason they've not is because they're too small like that's crazy like if you've got the ability I think for me like, Jordan Pickford's not the tallest goalkeeper but look how well he does do you know what I mean so Dean Henderson's not I think it's, you are Dean Henderson's not either exactly yeah so I think it's ridiculous that that's even a point to be honest yeah I mean because so the reason I ask is because uh, when the boys Academies contact me. One of the questions that we'll always ask is, how tall are they? How tall's the dad? Etc. But when the RTCs contact me, it's, it's never a question. It's always focused on the ability, and which is, I think, what where it should be really. I mean, I, I hope that would die out. I hope it does because I feel like it's a a silly kind of quality to look at. Like at the end of the day, if you like if you can make the high over the top of your head and keep the ball out, then why should it matter? And I think with the sports science as well now, with, with how you can in, increase your spring and your power, and you can focus on that. The areas that, like with anything, the areas that you don't that you're lacking, the areas that you can work on with the sports science and and get into the top corners with your spring rather than getting into the top corners with your with your, physica with your, with your physicality. Yeah, there. definitely. Mm. Kind of the taller goalkeepers, particularly in the men's game, you never see them jump. It's just like they use the height, but can they even jump? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I know that's a silly yeah. question, but you don't see it because they use the height. So then that's like me saying, well, how high can you jump regardless of your height? Yeah. And I think you, you find that with the outfield as well, though, don't you? If you've got a big, tall defender or a big, tall striker, 
they, they, they go through their career not having to jump. So they probably yeah, do, exactly. probably do lose the ability and the development to jump. So then when they actually do need it, they, they haven't got that development there and that power. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good. So from that then, what, what qualities do you think makes a good goalkeeper? Um, I think communication is a massive one. Um, I feel like ever since I was young, I've always spoke quite a lot to my players. And I guess from being young and people saying to me, oh, that's a good quality of goalkeeper, you need to talk a lot. But to be honest, being young, I was like, I don't know what to talk about. Like, what, what do I say? And I guess that's something you pick up as you go through your career and you get a better understanding of the game and you know what you you know what you now got to say. And it just comes naturally. Yeah. Um, so I think that's not something to worry about as much when you're young um, because that will become natural. Um, I think angles and awareness of your goal, I would always say, is a big one. Um, if you can make, if you're in a better angle, you're going to make an easier save. Whereas if you're giving yourself a bigger distance to make up, then it's going to be a stretch whether you get there or you don't. Um, and I think something which I pride myself on is distribution. And I know that's kind of come into play over the last few years with men's goalkeepers, and they're like, let's say you're playing a back three, you're playing a back four, now you've got a keeper in because. It's so pushed to be using your keeper and their distribution. Um, so I think that you've got to be comfortable with that. Um, but I think, like, again, it's not something to stress about because I feel like that comes with more experience. If somebody, if you've never been pressed before and someone's not come towards you, then you're probably not going to know how to deal with it. But as long as you're working on that, then you'll just adapt to it. Yeah. And I, and I think I think the higher you play as well, you, you, you sometimes get that more time because they will sit back off you and let you, let you have the ball. Whereas you get the lower down, you, you'll get that ratty player and they'll, they'll chase everything down no matter what. So yeah, Definitely. And I think one point which I always do is, because I am quite small on a corner, I'll stand further out. So then they put the ball away from me. So it looks like, rather than I'm putting it in the six-yard box, because I'm stood there and it looks like I'm going to come for it, yeah. and they'll put it to the 18-yard box, for example, because they don't want the keeper to come for it. Yeah, so they're playing it further out, maybe it's penalty spot area to keep it away from you. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it gives you a chance to react if they do win a header or whatever. Yeah. So so what about uh, dealing with shots then? So you're talking about how you deal with, with your shorter height. Do you, do you adjust your positioning with the shots? Do you get down the line a little bit more or, or do you give yourself um, more reaction time? I feel like from a distance... I'd probably say I'm about three yards out. Um, I know some people, I've had some coaches where they said, kind of sink to your line um, and it gives yourself more reaction time as being in, some of the coaches I've had have been in the men's game and seen it, that's the difference. But for me, that doesn't work for me. Like I feel like you've just got to find what works for you and whether that's staying high and saving it or give, going to your line and giving yourself more time. Definitely 1v1s. I'll definitely come out and eat the space up yeah. and make it hard for them. Um, but obviously then the one that you've got to be careful of is the lob, <laughs> but being small, but I guess you just got to get your distances right. Yeah, and your, so, time, your timing right is when you go down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, we, we've already covered dealing with mistakes. That's always something that we, we tend to pick on because that's always a big question with, um, with the younger goalkeepers. So... On, on female goalkeepers as well, one of the things that, that I learned as well when I was doing one of my courses is um, how, how the girls are more prone to knee injuries because of, because of the hips and, and whatever. So what, what tips can you give for the young girls to, for any extra warm-ups they can do or anything like that? Um, I didn't actually know that until, like I said, I joined Chelsea. Um I feel like it's always important to be doing maybe like hip exercises or stretching your quads out and your groins and stuff like that because that's obviously, it all works together. Yeah. Um, when I was growing in particular, I had a lot of uh, muscle problems around my hips, um, especially being a female when I was at Chelsea. Um, 
And then obviously back problems as well, because your quads are your front and your back is obviously the back part. So I think just kind of doing a little bit of extra, if you can uh, maybe get some stretches in before training. Um, I never like to go into training feeling stiff um, because I just feel like it's maybe a recipe for disaster. It's like you, if you're already stiff as it is and if you overstretch, you're going to pull something. So I'd probably just say maybe take an extra five minutes to go out and or do it at home before you go to training to do some stretches and stuff. I mean, I mean, like like you say, it's not something that's what's well documented, is it, about that the the extra injuries that the girls can get just because of the how the bodies are different to the men's. And I think if if you especially I mean with the men's coaching being so dominant as well, whereas we need to get more women involved to to help with the girls with that, that it's important that the girls take on board that they need to do these extra stretches to avoid the injuries that the boys probably don't need to do as much just because of how their bodies are different. Yeah, definitely. And I think even more emphasis on the fact that we're goalkeepers, like I don't think people sometimes appreciate how much your body goes through with kind of the position you might put your legs in or the force that's going through your hips and your and your quads and your knees with the explosive movement. So I think even more so it impacts us um, that little bit more than maybe what it does a normal outfielder because they're not having to be as flexible um, or do them explosive movements um, that we are. I think with a modern with a modern blocking technique as well. I mean the positions that you, we need to get as bodies in for them, which obviously weren't used so much five ten years ago. They they really need working on with the stretchers, don't they? And and warming up and making sure that you do the extra away from the pitch to make sure that you stay agile. Yeah, definitely. I'd always always see a difference whenever we do a blocking or a spreading session um, the next day afterwards. So I'd always make sure that um, I have a good warm up before if I'm doing that session and I always stretch afterwards as well, because you feel it the next day, yeah. especially having a ball smashed at you. And then you're in that position where you're trying to kind of stay strong so that it stays out. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you try, if the girls train on grass or AstroTurf, but that also has an effect on me as a player being on AstroTurf and uh, doing that because of the impacts from the, um, from the pitch on your hips. Yeah. Yeah, it does, take, it does take a lot more now. You're done to working on the. I mean, we're majority uh, grass. A couple of a couple of venues are that for turf, but I mean, even just coaching, I can. I, I actually feel more tired when I get home coaching on an astro turf pitch than what I do when I'm on a grass pitch, and that's just because it takes so much more out of your legs. Yeah, you know, walking around or whatever, it you can feel a, a, an actual difference in it. Yeah, so any tips on penalties then? Um, <laughs> I would say um, normally if the player stood straight, if the player stood straight onto the ball, they're not curved their run or anything, they're probably going to go. So if you're in the net, if you imagine yourself in the net and you can see them stood straight in front of you, they're probably going to go to your right come across the ball that way because um, it's impossible to run straight and then open your hips up to go to your left um, and I'd always try and look at their planting foot so the foot that they're planting next to the ball if it's pointing towards your right then the ball's probably going to go right that's a tip that I've been told before if you look at their planting foot but that was quite difficult to do because of how quickly obviously a penalty happens um, so even if you look afterwards, let's say it does go in because the odds, are, the odds are against you. If you look afterwards and you see that that thought is pointing that way, then maybe you can pick up on it again. Um, that's re it's a really difficult skill to train because you can't, you're also trying to psych them out and stuff like that and, and stay tall. And obviously the rule what got brought in recently about one foot on the line, which is just... It's ridiculous you can't generate any power or any movement that like, to be thinking about that keeping one foot on the line and also watching a, bo a player's body um it's just it's difficult but what has helped me so if we play a team normally our analyst would send me maybe the clips of their uh, top penalty taker um 
and recently we played Man United in the friendly and I was watching uh, Ella Toon's tips, if some of you know who that is, who's just recently played for England and um, the different, you could see the difference in when she went left to when she went right in the way that her run-up was straight and when she went to the keeper's left, her run-up was very curved and she just placed it instead. Um, so obviously as your career goes on or maybe you could use YouTube to watch some clips to see other people's body as well. Um, just to try and train it and see what I'm on about. Yeah. Right, but we've talked that it's, it's very difficult to actually learn a lot from the goalkeepers watching it on TV because there's a lot you can learn because on TV, obviously they're, all, they're always following the ball. So you only yeah. have to see where the ball is. And a lot of the time you never actually see what, what the goalkeeper's doing unless the shot's coming in. So it's it's important to try and get some live games in into it to try and see what the keepers are doing. And yeah, definitely. When I was younger, um, I needed to go to some games with my brother and my dad. We used to watch England quite a bit. And the amount of goals that I missed because I was too busy watching the other goalkeeper, what they were doing and the balls at the other end. Yeah. Because I'm watching how high they are, their angles, what they're saying to the defence. And I used to think, how, why are they still talking to the defence when the ball's up, sat up the other side of the pitch? But obviously in case they lose the ball yeah. um, that now but yeah it's, I think um, you can take away a lot from live football especially watching the goalkeepers and um, just make sure you don't miss any goals <laughs> so I think it's good to go watch a neutral game as well isn't it so if you go watch a team where you're not bothered about the result or you haven't got any connection with the team so it, you can just free yourself up and watch the keepers and maybe just watch one one half and watch the other one half differences on the two goalkeepers that are playing Maybe yeah. seeing what they do differently as well. Yeah. Rather than just watching the game, watching the ball up and that your team's going to win. Yeah. <laughs> right, I'm going to I'm gonna let Grace come and ask a question earlier on because the last few weeks, all the questions I've asked have, have been Grace's questions. So, so go okay. on. Right. So my first question is, uh, what's it like playing for United? What's it like? Hmm. Do you know what, Grace? It's a bit crazy at the minute because having left here when I was 15 and coming back, what is it, eight years later, my family have not even been able to watch me in the stadium. So it's a bit of a weird one at the minute. Um, and it's nice playing for my hometown. Um, and obviously... My dad's a blade, so we're waiting on kind of getting fans in the stadium and he's going to get a coach load of his mates. So that'll be good. But um, it's just nice to be around Northerners, which sounds so weird, but moving to London and being around kind of Southern people, which I guess people can say sometimes that they're not very nice or they're not as friendly. Um, so, yeah, it's just nice to be home. And we've got a really good team um, of good people as well. So we've got a really good dressing room. We've got a bit, a bit of jazzy dancing going off in that dressing room. <laughs> Thank you. Also, do you have any tips of how to follow in your footsteps? Hmm. So who are you playing for at the minute? I'm playing for China Ridgeway, like a local grassroots team. Okay. Um... I would always say enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, why are you doing it? To be blunt. Um, and you do look like you enjoy it a lot. You've not stopped smiling. <laughs> um, I would always just say don't be too hard on yourself. And like Paul said at the start, you never know who's watching. Um, never, ever burn your bridges with a club you've been to. So, for example, me leaving Sheffield United because I didn't leave it on bad terms and everything ended well, it gave me the opportunity to come back. Mm. Whereas I feel like sometimes if um, you're leaving a club and you leave it badly, you're probably not going to return there. And I think don't be scared as well. I had a question like this before. Don't be scared of moving. Um, I mean, it's very scary at the start, but once you're settled, you're fine. So if there does become an opportunity to move on to somewhere which you think is going to be better for you and um, it's going to be tougher, um then take it thank you okay so if if anyone else has got any questions just stick your hand up and we'll, we'll come to them as we go through 
So we'll, we'll work through to uh, we've got Freddie. Yes, Freddie. What motivates you? Okay, so this is a weird one because I've got different things. I think at the minute what motivates me is clean sheets. I'm currently drawn top with clean sheets in the whole league. Um, and with how well we're doing at the minute, I just want to keep keeping them so we can win. There's, there's a trophy for clean sheets and I think our, um, our defensive displays at this season have been really good. So it'd be nice to kind of be acknowledged for that. The teams above us in the league at the minute are full time and we're not. So I'd say we're doing pretty well to be third. Um, but I also think what motivates me is my mindset and knowing where I want to be and knowing that even though I've been in WSL one and I'm now in the championship play and I, I know I want to be back in that league. So I guess I drive myself and also my family push me. My, I'm very close to my sister who's also called Grace. Grace. Um, and obviously my dad um, and my grandma comes to watch all my games and she's 83. So that's really nice. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably say my mindset, kind of goals at the minute and my family. Good questions, Freddie. And we've got, we've got one from Izzy. Yes, Izzy. Um, what was the best decision you made in becoming a professional footballer? Um, probably moving to Chelsea I think that was my best decision um, also my most daunting one ever I've never been as scared at 16 years old moving home when I've always lived at home and um, kind of never really moved away so I think that was probably my best decision um, just in the way that people then knew who I was um, I always used to say to my brother when I was younger, oh, how amazing would it be to have your name on the back of your shirt? And for me now, that, that's slightly normal. So it's just crazy that that's a thing. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably say that. Thank you. Very good. So so what's, uh, what's your training regime at the minute then, your weekly training regime? So we're part-time currently, so we train... Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights. And I normally do something extra either Friday or Saturday um, because obviously being full-time previously, I just feel that three days isn't isn't enough. Um, and I like to be do something a little bit more sharp before a game. And obviously we play a game on a Sunday, have a Monday off and then train again on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, so that's kind of our, yeah, just our plan at the minute. I think next season it's going to be moving to Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, which I think will be better because it breaks it up a little bit more. Yeah. Um, it's difficult because some of the players are working part-time jobs as well. So obviously we train in the evenings. It's I don't think people realise kind of how difficult it can be because of, like, like you say, the, the money gap between WSL 1 and Championship is huge and it is getting there slowly, but... For the time, like what the girls sacrifice to be able to play football just because they love it is is a hell of a lot. We've got players travelling from, I don't know if any of you support Chef United or follow us, but for, that, for example, we've got Katie Wilkinson. She travels from Birmingham three nights a week. Right. We've got players in on the, on the edge of Liverpool and Manchester who travel three nights a week there and back. And um, one's travelling from Scarborough. So it's, it's a bit of a distance, two hours each way to then train um, and return. But everybody just does it because they love it. And I know that our goal as a team is promotion um, and in hope that we get back in that top league. So hopefully next season, I don't feel like we're going to catch Leicester at the minute with 10 points adrift. But I think we've done pretty well against two teams which probably got. 200% more of, our, of a budget than what we've got and obviously part-time players. Yes, so it's amazing to see. So obviously uh, that, that them girls are probably working as well and then they're doing the travelling, training and travelling back. It's, it's amazing how much that can take out of them, isn't it? Like not just, not just physically, but mentally and to be able to perform on top of that as well. Yeah, definitely. I think 
one of the things I've struggled with this season, it's kind of been a bit of a culture shock to me because since I've been 17, I've been a full-time footballer and that's just been my only income. Yeah. And and coming back to Sheffield United, I've had to get a job. So I'm working part-time in the school um, as a maths teacher now as well. And that's been really difficult for me mentally to kind of adjust to going to getting up at half six in the morning, going to work for eight o'clock, getting home at three or four, and then going back to training at six at night and not going until 10. So it's been like six in the morning till 10 at night, three days a week. So that's been really difficult. I, I've just come home from work today, <laughs> yeah. had a nap, and now I'm on and now I'm on this call. <laughs> but um yeah, definitely for the players, like I said, if we're finishing training at half nine, they're not going home till half eleven. Yeah. Uh, and I'm obviously up for work the next day. One of the girls is working in, in a hospital at the minute has been doing the COVID tests, actually processing them and um if like the general public was to send them off and um send the results back because so she's with work the next day at, at work for seven. So she's probably getting up getting like six hours sleep. So it's obviously going to be difficult to get the nutrition on board into it as well and, and working around that and just just difficult. In yeah, def- that's a massive point. And I think for the people that are on the call now, obviously probably got the family helping them out with that. But that's been really difficult to for me to fit in. Um, and I've still had to have my family helping me out now at 23 years old. But I think the main thing is if you're ever in this position, it's, it's worth it and it might seem hard at the time. Um, but it is definitely worth it. And I always say that people that kind of suffer the most are also going to be the most experienced because if you've not ever experienced struggle, how are you ever going to deal with it? If you do experience it, you're not going to deal with it well. Yeah. Um, I, think it's but I was to face a situation now where I was to maybe get an injury. I'd know how to deal with it because I've been injured before and I've been in that mental space where you've got to kind of somehow focus yourself to get back fit. I think also as well, if, if if you go through your life always being at the top and never experiencing the difficulties to get to the top, you, you, you never give it 110%. Whereas if you've experienced the difficulties and the heartache and, and the, the tiredness from putting all the extra in, when you then get that success, you, you don't want to lose it. So that makes you, keeps you pushing and working hard. Yeah, and I feel like mentally, when you've had the struggles, you just want to give in. I've had that that myself. I've been so many times, I'm like, do I want to do this anymore? Um, but it's always, I've always said, it's the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. When you have a low, it's the lowest you've ever been. But the highs are unbeatable. Like winning the FA Cup, like that's crazy. Um, obviously I didn't play that but when I first joined Chelsea and I was in the squad and at Wembley and I was like this is just mental <laughs> um, and I think that's that's one of the experiences I've had which kind of drives me to I want I want that myself I want to be playing and I want that myself I don't just want to be part of a team and I think that them feelings as well is I mean, I don't think you get them in any any other form of life the, the feelings that you get when you get success within a team and, and like that, you can't. So to hang on to it for as long as you can and play as long as you can, I think for me is vitally important. Yeah, definitely. I think that's why sport brings so many people together. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got we've got another question from Izzy. Yes, Izzy. What was the best piece of advice you've had? Um, I'd probably say two. I had a piece of advice, what I said earlier on in the call, um, which was actually we had, as goalkeepers, our goalkeeping coach at Chelsea organised like a um, workshop, like, let's say, with Petr Cech, who we probably all know, wears like the helmet on his head, um, or did. <laughs> and he spoke to us all as a group of goalkeepers, and that was the person that told me about the nil-nil, said always treat a game like it's nil-nil. Um, as soon as your mindset is focusing on something else, you're not focusing on what's currently happening in front of you, and it's probably going to happen again. So, like I said earlier on in the call, probably that. And then another piece of advice was um, from a manager at the time at Chelsea, Emma Hayes, who's still there now. Who I love to bit. She was like my second mum moving there, being so young. Um, and she always said to me, 
experience the highs but stay humble because I feel like being so young if you're experiencing something which is amazing you automatically kind of take that for a given in your mind that that's like the usual um and I think it was almost like she wanted me to be part of those experiences with the team but also know what it took to get there um so I'd probably say that but I, th I think you. that's some good advice as well, isn't it? When you're experiencing things at a young age, you just tend to go with the flow, don't you? And just take it as it comes and, and not experiencing the, the downside of stuff as, as a young age. It, like we said before, it stops you from working that little bit harder because you just think it's easy. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got, got another question from Freddie. Yes, Freddie? What, one second, Paul. Sorry, go on. Yes, Freddie. Does your brother like to still put you in that net now you're really good? <laughs> no, he doesn't, Freddie, because he can't beat me anymore. <laughs> no, to be fair, my brother doesn't play football as much anymore. Um, if there was a football, I guess he'd always have a kick about with me, but he's moved on to other things. <laughs> Question, Freddie. Yes, Grace. Uh, who's your favourite goalkeeper? Um, growing up, it was Van der Sar, who was obviously at Man United, um, just because I loved him. Um, and my brother, used when he used to put me in the goal, he'd call me Van der Fran. Um, which was quite funny and he's stuck, he's stuck with me forever. Um, probably in the women's game, <coughs> I used to lag the... Sorry, I've got... Up. COVID. I used to like the German goalkeeper. She was called Angra, but she recently retired and I think she was the only goalkeeper to ever win FIFA Player of the Year. It's always been an all, like an outfield player um, and she was really good. So if you could watch some clips on her... Um, just how powerful she was and demanding um, she just made it easy for herself and but also when she was kind of called upon to make a save she she never really slipped up ever okay good you, you've you've mentioned a Thank few you. well done grace you mentioned a few um of the men's goalkeepers i mean obviously when you were younger you probably didn't have the option to to watch the ladies as much as what the men's, but now there's more access to watching the ladies. Would you advise the, the young girls to watch the ladies more than the men, or do you think they can get as much from watching the men as they can the ladies? Um, I still think a mixture of both is good, um, because I guess, in my point of view, we're still slightly behind the men's game, so anything they're doing, we're going to probably be moving towards that, if you get what I mean. Yeah. But I think it's also good to be realistic in watching the women to see um kind of what you should be aspiring for right here and right now um I guess it's weird for me being in that league to say that I'll look up to one of those goalkeepers as soon as I play against them um but I know that's obviously happened for quite a lot for outfield players being like I know Chloe Kelly for example um being in the um Arsenal team playing with like Rachel Yankee she was like it was mind-blowing growing up watching her but that kind of was, I think, a lot more, um, a lot more apparent for outfield players to be in that position because, I guess, say outfield players, Rachel Yankee, Casey Stoney, all the ones in the England set up at the time, everybody knew who they were. Whereas I don't really feel like a goalkeeper was, was like that. I, mean, I, th I think you can always, you, I mean, you can even, you can take tips from even people who were, but what after your shirt, can't you? I mean, the, the girls that you train with, you'll they'll see things in their game that you can help with your game as well. So I think it's important that you you try and watch as many different goalkeepers as possible, like you said, girls and boys, and uh, try and pull the plus bits what you can adapt to your game. Yeah, definitely, and I think everybody talks about that goalkeeper union all the time, and um, I guess when you're one on one with other people, you, you, I guess you're watching them all the time and you're thinking, what can I take from them? What are they doing better than me? 
um, and also helping them, like some of the young kids that train with us, I, I not that I'm stepping on the coach's toes because he likes it, but I'd always say maybe you could do this next and advise them. And I think if you notice something about um, someone else in your group, let's say, no coach would ever say, no, you can't say that because you're all trying to make each other better. Yeah. I mean, sometimes for me as well, I think that at listening to someone who you're training with who's, who's probably a, a bit older than them as well, they, sometimes they take that information on board a little bit more than what they do from the coach because they just see the coach as a coach. But if one of the older goalkeepers kind of says, oh, you're doing really well, but try and do this a little bit differently or try and do that, sometimes that can have a, a better impact than what the coach says. Yeah, definitely. I think um, when I was in my second year at Chelsea, we signed Carly Telford and she was at Notts County at the time. Um and she was so helpful to me, um, training day in, day out and advising me or giving me that boost I might have needed when when I was tired from doing my A-levels and coming into training and being tired. And that was also a time when mentally I had to be strong because I was absolutely shattered. But you can't kind of flop at an opportunity like that training with Chelsea's first team. So yeah. I guess it was something I had to train myself in and... I'm still tired a lot now, but I know how to deal with it now. Um, living the life I live, like I said before. Um, but she was very helpful, yeah, in my development and kind of pointing things out, which maybe the coach didn't even see sometimes. Like you said, it's not as though just because they're older, sometimes the coach is watching four goalkeepers and they might not pick something up about me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think we're t touching on, on the tiredness as well, that's something what the kids have to deal with a lot of the minute with them being at school. Obviously, difficult times as well. Luckily, they've had a bit of time to get used to going back to school before they're going to start back with me in a couple of weeks' time. So they should have got over, over that a little bit. But any tips you can give on that? Just just mental toughness? Or... Um, I'd say always focus on the goal, like I said before. Um, I think if you know that you're doing this for a reason um, and that's exactly what you want to do, you want to be a footballer, then... Um, right now, I'd say for the young ones, especially education is just as important because football is not a career forever. Even for me, I'm probably not going to be playing football longer than 35 to 40 years old, being a goalkeeper, if I've got it in my legs. <laughs> um, but I would definitely say with the tiredness, um, just sleep where you can. When I was um, When I was at Man United, my dad used to drive me to training twice a week um, and that was obviously like an hour and 15 and I used to sleep on the way to training, uh, wake up and train and then sleep on the way back or do my homework on the way back and when I think about it now it was, it was a lot and I guess I didn't realise what I was doing but the focus was football and as long as I knew I was going training then I, I was fine. Okay, but one, one of the questions in the chat is uh, what, what what's your... Your daily nutrition, what what type of things do you eat? Um, I'd probably say on a day of training that I'd be better. So I'd normally have like porridge in the morning, uh, maybe a smoothie, um, get all my fruits out of the way and nutrients. Um, maybe for my lunch, I would have um, maybe like a wrap or something like that. Um, with maybe a few carbs in, uh, rice and rice and a wrap. I don't really eat meat. I've gone, I've gone away from eating meat, so I'm eating corn quite a bit. Um, so probably that, and then maybe for my um, tea, I would have lots of vegetables. Um, after training, I would eat after training because training's quite early at six o'clock. It's quite an awkward time to eat at like four before training. Yeah. So I'd eat um, after training. And just have something uh, really filling um, to obviously go to sleep to the next day. I mean, um, your your eating room is very similar to to the students as well, because obviously you you're working in the day, and then obviously having to make sure you get your nutrition on board to train at the evenings, like they train in the evenings as well. So it's it's quite good to hear what what you tend to eat on a daily basis, because that is similar to what to what they do, rather than listening to some of the full-time pros, who obviously their, their training's in the morning, so their nutrition's a little bit more... Yeah, definitely. 
I think the main thing is I, I wouldn't, I mean, not that you could go and eat McDonald's every night, but I wouldn't focus on it too much being young because um, I would say like being in academies and stuff, people can get obsessed with that. Um, and I know there's been times when t- people in my team will struggle because uh, the managers are getting on to them about what they're eating, if they're eating enough, if they're eating too much. Um, but I think if you're enjoying it and your food's, it won't be having an, an effect on you. Unless you're eating too close, I'd say that's the, that's the main thing, timing. I think, obviously, your parents and your family will be the ones that are feeding you. And I expect it's not burgers and chips every night and chicken nuggets. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't stress about that too much, being young. Um, just probably say timing, because I know if I used to eat too close to training at night time, I'd feel sick. Um, and I didn't feel like I could move very well. Um yeah, so that's probably the main point I'd say is the timing on it. And I think also with that is, is your energy levels, isn't it? Your energy levels can be high at the start of the session and then all of a sudden your energy drop up, just plummet because of, because of your timing and when you're eating. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we've got, got a question in the chat again from Olivia. Olivia wants to know what gloves you wear. I wear one glove. Um, wait, I've got a pair here on site. I'll show you. Here we go. So they're my gloves. The pink, they brought them out, um, I think, earlier on in the year. And I don't think they sold very well, but I took about, they gave, sent me a box of about 30 pairs because they just sent me gloves and um, they sent quite a few uh, the women's players' gloves in the leagues. Um, but they're really not, they're not too expensive at all because I know some of the gloves you can get are between £70 and like £120 a pair, especially like Nike and stuff like that. Um, And I think that was one thing I struggled with when I was younger, training at the academy, being on an AstroTurf pitch. They used to just, they'd they'd ruin so easily. So these are a very good glove, which don't kind of tear up. And I think they're only about £30 to £40 a pair. So I'd recommend... Do you think the the cut of the glove is is important with a... Because I mean, I, I I don't think it is too much with the, the I don't think the girls' hands differ too much to the boys' hands at times. But do you think a a a performly uh, girl glove the cut of the latex would make a difference? Or um, I don't know because I always say this is a bit of a weird point. But when I look at my hands and how big they are, nobody's got like big hands in my family. And I think have I got big hands because I'm a goalkeeper. Or what? So I don't feel like the goalkeeping glove should be any different for the other boys, but I think you should wear what you feel comfortable in. I've always wore uh, negative. I don't like roll finger. I just don't like the way they kind of, they're so bulky on your hands. Yeah. Um, and these are, these are negative, so they look like they're quite slim. Oh, very good. Any more questions off anybody else? Right in there. So what? So what's? Uh, we'll just finish off last few minutes. What's your match day? What's your match day preparation then? As you run up into a game. Um. So the night before, if it's an away game, we will travel down the day before and stay over, and then we'd normally have like our evening meal together and just chill. Um. It's been a bit weird at the minute with being COVID because we would normally have like a. Um a roommate let's say two people in a room and I can't even imagine the cost of what it of what it's been because now everybody's got to have their own room because of Covid um and my roommate has been I live with uh Courtney Sweetman Kirk who's on my team I lived with her for two years at Liverpool so she was my roommate so we'd just normally just chill before bed and maybe watch some clips like I said of the goals scored that the team scored recently and maybe the penalty takers um, and then the next day I'd have a breakfast of maybe a bowl of fruit and yoghurt and maybe some porridge um, and then we'd normally have like a team walk um, and a team meeting and then head to the game so nothing too special really I like to listen to music on the way to the game I don't really like to talk to people if we're on a coach um, just so I can have that bit of time to myself. Sometimes being around the team can be a bit too much over a whole weekend. Um, and then if it's a home game, the same really. I like to get to the stadium 
uh, walk around the pitch, see what the pitch is like with my earphones in, and then and then get out and get the warm up done. So warm up then. What what's your general warm up? Uh, so normally we just start with distribution, um, then into like volleys, half volleys, bit of handling, uh, low saves each side, dipping volleys, um, and shot stopping and crossing, and then a uh, few more kicks at the end. Would, and then we the go into. Warm, would you do the same warm up every week? Yeah, we do the same warm up every week. Yeah, for the mental preparation. Yeah. Yeah, would you adjust it slightly to the to the team if you knew the team maybe is stuck a few more crosses in? Would you do a bit more crossing if, if you knew the shot from distance or anything like that? Um, we would normally do that in training in the week, yeah. so it's quite good because the goalkeeping coach looks at kind of their strengths and what, what we're going to face. So the whole week, maybe, if they shoot from distance, will be shots from distance. Um, the warm-up wouldn't really change because it covers everything. Yeah. So it covers a little bit of everything. So yeah, the warm up's the same, but I think just the weekly plan would change. And um, even with the team, apart from the goalkeeping um, session in a week, maybe that would change on if I'm going to be pressed by their strikers, we'd press in training as well. So that's for me to deal with in training. So it gets used to it. Okay, good. Any superstitions? No, I don't have any actually. Um, I know a lot of people have like put your right sock on, then your right boot, and your left sock, and your left boot. But no, I don't really have any superstitions. <laughs> don't don't interfere with your preparation, then, does it? No, definitely not. I, I don't really feel like I'm quite chilled to be honest when it comes to a game day. Like I said, as long as someone's not yapping in my ear on the way to the game, I'm like, I just want a little bit of 10, 10 minutes. But when you stay. Um, if we're staying on a way trip, it's probably between 15 and 20 minutes away from the stadium. So it's only like a 15 minutes to yourself. Um, so, yeah, that's about it, really. OK, brilliant. I think that's... Uh, you'll be ready for another nap, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has anybody got any more questions? Any more? Freddie, Freddie looks like he wants to ask one. <laughs> Grace, Grace, have you got any more? Have I asked? I can't see any. Not got their cameras on. No, that I did. Oh, so so brilliant, Fran. Love that. It was nice to get an insight of the girls' game as well, as well as the boys' game. And I'm sure the students have loved that. We've got we've got quite a few who've requested the recording as well. They couldn't make it tonight. Okay. We're moving it to a, a Friday from a Thursday. So there'll be, no doubt there'll be a few watching it. And then if they've got any questions after that, I'll send them through to you, and we'll we'll get them answered for them. Perfect. Yeah, if you've got, a, I don't know if you've got Instagram or anything like that, but if any of you've got any questions, if you ask Paul or message my Instagram, I'll, I'll obviously reply to you. Okay, brilliant. Thanks a lot, Fran. Enjoyed that. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.